Jacksonville, Arkansas, Little Rock Air Force Base. On the flight line, military precision is on display. But the impressive sight of the C-130 transport aircraft stands in stark contrast to another scene just a mile away within base gates. A military exercise gone awry. The remnants of a battle waged against an unexpected foe. A private contractor hired to build and manage 468 new military family homes at the base. A job it never finished. Now this is what I call Jurassic Park. Uh, and we've got you know, concrete slabs to partial houses built. The homes were just stopped in various stages of construction as the different contractors walked off the job because they weren't being paid. It's just as if you turned the light off back in April of 2007. Nothing's changed since then. The private housing company is called American Eagle Communities. In 2004, it came with the lowest bid not only to build the new homes, but to renovate and manage more than 700 more at the Little Rock base. At the time, the deal was estimated to be worth $500 million. Catherine Thompson, the managing director of American Eagle, came to Jacksonville to celebrate the new project. If you looked at the presentation that American Eagle made, it was a great proposal. Uh, and that was really as six months after the initial contracts being signed, we started seeing performance problems delays and cost overruns as well as more more delays and uh, we, we, we ended up with a company that was even unable or unwilling to perform up to the agreement uh, in the contract. After building only 25 of the 468 new homes, American Eagle left town. So we still have airmen and their families that are living in housing that was built in the 1950s. They're promised nice new houses. And that's what I was upset about. Seattle, Washington. Known for rain, software, and aircraft manufacturing, it is also home to a large military community. 80,000 Navy, Air Force, and Army personnel living and working at seven different bases. And in February 2005, even as project delays were beginning back in Little Rock, American Eagle landed another military housing contract here. John Jack oversaw that contract. I started with American Eagle in March of 05. My job was to administer the contractual agreement between the general contractor and American Eagle Communities, as well as minister the um, budget controls. He didn't like what he saw. He says he wanted to do the right thing. He became a whistleblower. But he'd gotten nowhere spending two years of his life trying to convince authorities that the project had gone awry. Now he called a reporter at the Seattle Post-Intelligencer, Eric Nolder. He said right away that uh, he was quite nervous. Um, he said he had never called anyone like this before. But right away, he told me that it involved a large military project. But he said to me, and I remember the, the words were uh, something like, you wouldn't be, believe the fraud. John had a ton of information. It was a very complicated story that he was telling me, much more full of clinically uh, detailed information than full of anger. American Eagle was a newly formed company. And they told me that the project consists of 605 new homes with associated amenities package. On the surface, it looked great. Um, it, it appeared to be that there was more than enough money there to to construct the, the homes that it was uh, originally designed. The ideas and the concept behind what was happening was very fascinating. How do you administer a contract that is a governmental contract, but under private control? In 1996, 
Congress enacted a law that put military housing in private hands. Companies would compete for building and managing 180,000 new homes across the country, replacing housing dating to the 1950s. The law required public-private ventures, with each military branch given the job of overseeing their new housing partners. The program grew slowly at first, but soon it took off. In the Bush administration, you have a wish to turn over to private industry the business of government. In turning over the business of, of government to private industry, to release them from oversight. There's a lot of logic behind the idea. One of the logics is that if only government were to operate like private industry, then government would be a more efficient operation. But if you think about it, what if they spent money like the executives at Lehman Brothers and Enron? Do we really want our governments operating like that? Soon, a bevy of companies started competing for housing contracts. One was American Eagle. It won contracts in Florida, Georgia, Arkansas, Massachusetts, and Missouri. But its biggest deal was to build homes in the Seattle area at three Navy bases, Kitsap Banger, the Whidbey Naval Station, and Everett Naval Air Station. It was a lucrative contract that would total $3.2 billion over its life. The contract worked like this. American Eagle would form a partnership with the Navy, each putting in some investment money. For American Eagle, it was $5.5 million. Then, the partnership borrowed hundreds of millions more to build military homes. As part of the deal, American Eagle also gained the right to become a landlord, collecting rents on some 3,000 Navy homes in the Seattle region for 50 years. It's a very good deal because you get homes for free to manage and to collect rents on. You get upfront money from the taxpayer. And the rents are provided by the taxpayer because those are in the form of housing allowances given to military personnel. They are going to control that property for 50 years. Military officials say the industry that has risen out of the 1996 law is comprised of reputable companies and individuals. Eric Nolder discovered troubling facts, however, about some of American Eagle's principal players. Simply looking at court records, the Navy, Army, and the Air Force would have realized that they were dealing with two of the three major players in this company, that they were dealing with people that they might have second, third, or fifteenth thoughts about. Nolder found that Catherine Thompson, American Eagle's managing director, had led a developer in California, which defaulted on a multi-million dollar public housing project and then was sued by Orange County. The suit was ongoing when American Eagle got the contract in Seattle. Another thing is that in the early part of this decade, she went into bankruptcy proceedings. And uh, during those bankruptcy proceedings, it was revealed that she owed millions of dollars to the IRS. Then there was Carabetta Enterprises, a low-income housing developer in Connecticut and one of American Eagle's owners. Nolder would learn that Carabetta had a past problem with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. It was a big problem. Carabetta Enterprises, Inc. had uh, violated scores of HUD regulations and steered money the way they were not supposed to steer money within a HUD project. So badly did they do so that they were banned from HUD projects for uh, quite a while. Then why would the military partner with American Eagle? Pouring through civil lawsuit records, Nolder found a potential clue. Carabetta appeared to have agreed to pay retired four-star Air Force General Merrill McPeak $200,000 to help American Eagle with its first military contract. He was well connected in the Pentagon, and Carabetta had hired him to help American Eagle get their first contract, which was very important because once they got that first contract, that was the doorway to the remainder of those contracts. Overseeing American Eagle's $230 million Navy contract in Seattle, John Jack saw that it was not going according to plan. 
the original per square foot cost is $66 a square foot. But when I received the work package, it was $76 a square foot. There's 1.1, almost 1.2 million square feet of new home to be built. And you're $10 a square foot over, you're $12 million over right out of the chute. There was more. John Jack says that executives at American Eagle okayed the use of substandard building materials in the new houses. The reason a 50-year roof is specked out is because this is a 50-year contract. Makes sense. They installed a 30-year roof, which is half the cost. They went from copper piping to PEX piping. They um, went from hollow solid core doors to hollow core doors. So very substandard products than what was originally specced. So not only did they bill for $76 a square foot, but they're also putting inferior products in the home. More shocking to Jack was the response he said he got when he told his bosses at American Eagle. I started putting together letters and you know, cost analysis, and I was submitting them to my boss, and um, they were being overlooked. Uh, at this time, the, the, the Navy's clueless. The uh, Navy doesn't know what's going on. Um, you know, they, they, they see homes. They, you know, uh, were right out of the chute of construction. Uh, my bosses are telling me to be quiet. You know, don't, uh, don't talk about this. As the months progressed, John Jack says he kept detailed records. By that point, his estimates were showing that if allowed to progress, cost overruns for the Seattle project would amount to $28 million. Jack says his continual attempts to get his superiors at American Eagle to listen were ignored. Then, in February 2006, while still employed by American Eagle, he decided to take a new tack. He called the Navy. Surely, he believed, they would want to put a stop to the overruns. I called my counterpart in the Navy. We met middle of February over at the new model home. We were sitting in my truck, and I just handed her some documents that showed what my company was up to. And she asked me, point blank, how do we stop this? And... I said, you need to hold American Eagle to the terms and conditions originally agreed to. This moment in February of 2006 is a very key step for John Jack. He went from being an American Eagle uh, director of a project to being an, a, a whistleblower within American Eagle, going to the Navy and telling them that money was being wasted or who knows what was happening to the money and that the project was in trouble. When he reported this to the Navy, you would expect them to immediately halt everything on this project and, and turn every stone. They didn't really do that. In a subsequent meeting, Jack says, his Navy contact told him she had spoken with American Eagle and she had news. So we went downstairs in their cafeteria and she bought me a sandwich. And she says, they're firing you in two weeks. Before he was fired, he started gathering documents. I made copies of every document that I had, and I started taking them with me. Um, all my emails, all the letters, all the change orders, tens of thousands of, of, of different correspondence here and there. He filed a federal whistleblower lawsuit against American Eagle. He also turned his information over to the U.S. Justice Department, hoping to convince them to join him in suing on behalf of the Navy. The charge, American Eagle had illegally overbilled the Navy. Under the law, if the suit was a success, John Jack would receive a percentage of any financial settlement. And then for a year and a half, he went silent the result of a court gag order as the Justice Department investigated his claims. After Eric Nalder got that first phone call from John Jack in April 2008 about the Seattle contract, he decided to check out American Eagle's other deals. It became apparent very quickly that this was not an isolated 
example, that this was not an isolated problem. Nalder found that in one job after another, from Patrick Air Force Base in Florida to Fort Leonard Wood Army Base in Missouri, American Eagle's military home building projects had fallen behind schedule. In Jacksonville, Arkansas, home of Little Rock Air Force Base, local journalist John Hofheimer reported that civilians were suffering from American Eagle's actions as well. Little Rock Air Force Base is just an integral part of Jacksonville. Some airmen live in Jacksonville, their kids go to schools, and there's a great financial impact. The first indication we had that there were any problems occurred when we heard rumors that some of the contractors were being paid late or perhaps not being paid at all. That's when we started making uh, phone calls. American Eagle was perhaps months behind on paying them. And some of these are very small companies and this was really putting them in a bind. John Hofheimer reported that at least one subcontractor filed for bankruptcy. Dozens of others had to settle for small percentages of what they were owed. One holdout though is Tommy Austin whose cement business was contracted to pour the foundations of more than 200 houses for American Eagle. We didn't get near that number before the project was come to halt. We really ran hard on that project for approximately six months. His lawyers are still trying to get all the money he says he was promised. I have an investment up front every day. When I load a, a load of concrete and, and ship it out of here, I've invested in somebody's project, whether they pay for it or not. You know, my money went out the gate in that truck. Uh, if they don't pay me, then I'm, I'm stiff. We're still owed in excess of $70,000. That doesn't account for the attorney's fees and filing fees that we've been out. That's, that's money we'll never recover. I Googled Carabetta, I Googled American Eagle, and I discovered that Carabetta had a litigious history and, and frequently seemed to leave contractors unpaid. There's several empty foundations still sitting out there that has no construction on them. Contractor complaints about American Eagle made it all the way to Arkansas Senator Mark Pryor. I do consider them as a rogue company. I mean, they maybe underbid this contract in order to get it. They maybe had good intentions. It's hard to tell. But my preference is that they never be allowed to do any government contracting in the future. And the Air Force actually bears some of the responsibility here because they did not have tight controls over this process. They also, in my opinion, should have never given this contract to American Eagle in the first place. There were some red flags there some previous business dealings uh, with the federal government and with other uh, contracts they'd had. And I just feel like if, if the Air Force was doing its due diligence, you wouldn't have had this problem in the first place. Back in Seattle, it took the Navy more than a year after receiving inside information from John Jack to do anything about American Eagle, even as the company fell behind in building houses. And American Eagle was having performance issues and their reputation had been sullied somewhat. Some of their paperwork was way behind. They were also behind schedule as a combination of excusable and inexcusable delays and ultimately the Navy assessed damages against American Eagle for late performance. That penalty cost American Eagle $500,000, but it would be a fraction of what the Navy was willing ultimately to overlook. Soon it would issue what is called a change order for giving American Eagle $13.8 million in cost overruns, overruns said to be mainly due to weather delays. To John Jack, that amounted to pure profit. On August 3rd, 2007, the Navy forgave American Eagle communities through this single change order. And not only did they forgive them, but they paid them $13.8 million to do it. The financial problems were being, um, at the very least, uh, obfuscated. And John Jack would say we're being covered up uh, by the Navy 
forgiving um, the cost overruns and the delays. American Eagle was supposed to have built 605 homes in the Seattle area. It left town with 421 unbuilt. Of those, 141 were to have had their grand opening on this site. The original contract allocated that this project should have started in 2006 to house 141 single family residences. We have an undeveloped site that has no construction activity so far. And this lot was slotted to be done um, at the end of October 2008, uh, which was uh, six days ago. <laughs> In April 2008, it had appeared John Jack would finally be vindicated. He says he was told the Justice Department's whistleblower investigation supported his allegations. However, as Nalder would report, the Navy's forgiveness of that $13.8 million in cost overruns had weakened the Justice Department's case for prosecuting on the Navy's behalf. If the Navy was going to be its client, he would write, the client had waved the white flag. Subsequently, Jack's complaint against American Eagle on behalf of the Navy was dismissed, but it was, quote, dismissed without prejudice, which means Jack and or the Justice Department could still bring suit again. As for American Eagle, Nalder would report it had sold its share of the Seattle housing project to a company called Forest City Developers. When I first came here, no houses were under construction, and that was when American Eagle was handling this project. Forest City has taken over, and to their credit, they're moving as fast as they can to get these houses built, and will most assuredly do so under the new schedule they have. But it will still cost millions more. Nalder would report the sale of the housing contract to Forest City brought over $25 million. That's some 20 million more than American Eagle had originally invested. So they made a net gain just by selling the project. That is a lot of money to do the wrong thing. So what's in it to do the right thing? When the wrong thing pays. <laughs>